So namaste to all and welcome to the Gita class of the Vedanta Society of Greater Austin. So as always, I'll begin with a chant. Om Parthaya Pratibodhitam Bhagavata Narayanena Swayam Vyasena Gratitam Purana Munina Madhye Mohabharatam Advaitam Ritavarshinim Bhagavati Mashtada Shadhyayinim Ambatvam Anusanda Dhami Bhagavad Gita Bhavad Vaishinim Vasudeva Sutan Devam Kamsa Chadura Mardanam Devaki Paramanandam Krishnam Vande Jagad Gurum Mukam Karoti Vachalam Pangum Langhayate Girim Yatkripa Tamaham Vande Paramananda Madhavam Om, O Mother Bhagavad Gita, we meditate upon you who were made known to Partha, Arjuna, by the Lord Narayana himself. You who were included in the Mahabharata by the ancient sage Vyasa. You, the goddess who rains down the nectar of Advaita, non-dualism, in 18 verses. You, the destroyer of relative existence. We worship Krishna, world teacher, son of Vasudeva, the supreme delight of his mother Devaki, and the destroyer of the demons, Kamsa and Chanur. We adore the supremely blissful Madhava, Krishna, by whose grace the mute are made eloquent and the lame are enabled to cross over mountains. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tatsat Om Peace 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 be unto us all. So this morning in the Gita class, we are to begin chapter four. So the first chapter was Vishada Yoga, the yoga of sorrow. That is the sorrow of Arjuna, so-called because it expresses the confusion and the uh, the depression sorrow of Arjuna when he sees before him the people he's to fight against and realizes that they are his relatives. Then the second chapter is Sankhya Yoga, the chapter on uh, knowledge, where Sri Krishna tells him there's nothing to fear, nothing uh, to be sad about, because you are the divine self. All of these beings on the battlefield are the divine self. No one kills nor is killed in truth. That uh, birth comes uh, for the born, death is certain, and for the those who die, rebirth is certain. Uh, and so over that which uh, is certain, one shouldn't grieve. And then gives him again the knowledge of the highest self. Then in the third chapter, which we just uh, completed last class, uh, Sri Krishna teaches, it's called the, uh, the chapter of Karma Yoga, the yoga of action, where he teaches them how it is that one is to act in the world. And so this chapter, chapter four, is known as Jnana Karma, uh, Jnana Karma Sanyasa Yoga Nama Chatutodhyaya. The fourth chapter known as the chapter on the renunciation of action through knowledge. The renunciation of action through knowledge. So uh, through knowledge means not renunciation of activity itself, but renunciation of the uh, the ignorance that surrounds action. That is the, I, the idea that I am the doer, I am the enjoyer, uh, and that the action is for my sake. And so uh, all through the Gita, Sri Krishna is telling Arjuna that you have to act. Everyone has to act in this world, as he says in the third, uh, third chapter. 
He says, Sharira Yatra Pichate Na Prasidhyera Karmanaha. Uh, without uh, action, you can't even sustain the body. And so everyone is forced to work in this world. Even saying, I'm going to sit on the couch and not do anything, that itself is an action because you're taking a decision that I am going to sit on the couch. And then after a few minutes, you start feeling restless and want to get up and say, no, I'm going to sit here. I said, I'm going to sit here, so I'm just going to sit here. And so that itself is an action. So we can't avoid action. So uh, the third chapter deals with the nature of action and what we have to understand about action. And the fourth chapter really continues that. Uh, and so uh, we'll just jump into the first verse, which begins... Shri Bhagavan Uvaja Imam Vivaswate Yogam Proktavan Hamam Yayam Vivaswan Manave Praha Manurikshvakave Bravit. So here he talks about what is called the Parampara, the uh, succession of teachers in the teaching of this transmission of this knowledge. In India, the transmission of teaching is very important you find uh, something somewhat similar, uh, in fact, quite similar uh, in certain fields in the West. For instance, in uh, uh, psychology, those who follow union psychology, then they uh, often trace their uh, descent from Jung, that my teacher was a student of so-and-so and, -so, and uh, uh, that teacher was a, descendant, uh, was a student of so-and-so and back uh, to Jung himself. Uh, and so uh, in India, it was considered that the Guru Parampara, the uh, succession of teachers was important. Important to recognize so that you honor them uh, and also because it gives validity to the very things that you know because you got them not from your, just out of your own imagination, uh, but there is an authenticity and uh, to the knowledge which has been tested over time. So here, uh, Sri Krishna says, uh, it begins Sri Bhagavan Vacha, that is the blessed Lord said, imam vivaswate yogam proktavana ham avyayam. That I taught this avyayam yogam, this eternal yoga, uh, 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 vivaswate, to Vivaswan. I taught this blessed yoga that I'm teaching now to you. I taught it in ancient times uh, to Vivaswan, that is to the sun, the sun as a deity, uh, the sun as the ruler over uh, the uh, creation of this uh, solar system. So in uh, ancient Vedic times and continuing through classical Hinduism, but in a much more vital way in Vedic times, uh, the various uh, 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 forces in nature were seen as having consciousness behind them. And so the earth, even now when we do a puja, we pray to the earth and we give, make an offering to the earth, Mother Earth. It's not seen as just poetry, you know, in poetry, in Western poetry. And it's a phenomenon in all poetry, but in Western poetry, it has been analyzed into different figures of speech. And so one poetical usage is personification. So the earth, of course, is just a dead uh, ball of uh, uh, earth and rock uh, and lava, etc. But we personalize it and say, oh, Mother Earth. So that's just, po uh, just poetry, uh, pretending that the earth is our mother, as we might build a ship and uh, uh, christen it uh, if we're uh, in England, Her Majesty's ship uh, so-and-so, and then we address it as a she, uh, though the ship, of course, has no gender, but we personalize it. And so that's a poetic usage, uh, a poetic tradition of personalizing that which has no personality. But that's not what the Vedic seers were doing. Uh, they saw that behind every Thing within the universe, behind every force, behind every dynamic uh, process in, uh, in the universe, there was a consciousness identified. And so they saw within the sun a conscious uh, deity, the same within the moon, the same within the earth. Uh, and so again, in, uh, in a simple, even in a simple puja, we offer, uh, make an offering of a flower uh, to the earth. Uh, we make an offering of a flower, uh, an argya, that is a respectful offering 
uh, with several ingredients, uh, to the sun, uh, etc. And uh, so in Vedic times, that was the major religion. In classical Hindu, uh, Hinduism, which came after the Vedic times, then uh, that remained, in, uh, remained, but somewhat in the background. And then the different forms of Ishwara, God, uh, became dominant. And the minor de the deities that had been worshipped in the Vedic times, they became minor deities. So here, Sri Krishna, again, this was coming at the end of the Vedic period, or near the end of the Vedic period. Sri Krishna uh, said that, I taught this eternal yoga uh, to be Vaswan. So eternal yoga, why? Because it's based on principles. As you could say that the principles of physics as far as we have understood them, as far as we know them now, because science is a growing body of knowledge, uh, but the principles of physics are eternal. Uh, at least they're pointing towards something which is eternal. Even gravitation, there are arguments about the nature of gravitation. Uh, some modern physicists say that gravitation is not even a force. Uh, of course, it comes from the idea that it's the curvature of the time-space continuum, and so it's not a force. It's part of the way the time-space shapes itself. So, uh, but, I should say, but the principles of physics, as far as we've understood them, are or are pointing towards uh, eternal truths. Gravity, as I often say, gravity was not uh, invented by Newton. <laughs> and therefore the, uh, the, the Newton family uh, descendants do not have a, uh, uh, a patent on gravity. That you can only use gravity if you pay the uh, Newton descendants a certain amount of money. And no, he discovered a principle which is universal, which works as far as we know throughout the universe. Uh, and which is uh, co-eternal with the universe. It's the way the universe works. And so the idea of the Vedic knowledge, the basic principles of Vedic knowledge, not everything that's said in the Vedas, though yes, an Orthodox person says every single word of the Vedas is eternal. Uh, but a more modern uh, uh, approach to the Veda, as Swami Vivekananda gave us, was that those principles which were discovered in the Vedas those are eternal, uh, just as gravitation is eternal. The nature of the uh, human uh, existence, the nature of the human mind, the nature of consciousness, uh, the nature of reality, the relationship between the individual and the cosmos, these are eternal principles. Uh, and they were discovered in ancient times and passed down uh, from teacher to teacher uh, over the ages, over the millennia. And so that's why Sri Krishna says this eternal yoga, because it's based on eternal principles, not on somebody's opinion, uh, uh, not uh, somebody's imagination, making up some poetic statement, which sounds nice, uh, but who knows if it's true or not, but it sure sounds nice. No, nothing like that. It's the discovery of principles on the way that fundament, uh, the nature of fundamental reality uh, and our relationship to that fundamental reality. So, uh, Sri Krishna says, I taught this, uh, this eternal yoga to the sun, Vivaswan. Uh, again, seeing the sun not as the ball of fire in the sky, but as the deity uh, uh, which manifests as the sun. And then in the second half of the verse, he says, Vivaswan manave praha. And Vivaswan, the sun, taught it to Manu. Manu is uh, seen as the, uh, uh, the establisher of uh, human civilization. Uh, and Manu is said in the mythology. Again, we, at, this, uh, the, at this stage, we're in mythology, but not meaning by mythology a bunch of lies that somebody made up, but a way of seeing truth uh, uh, that is uh, not restricted to uh, the historical process, but which is a way of telling truth uh, through, uh, through story. And so the son gave this knowledge to Manu, the progenitor of human civilization. And Manu was considered to be the son, S-O-N, uh, of the son, S-U-N. 
the son of the sun. And in every cycle, every uh, period of creation, that is the uh, uh, between the uh, coming into existence of the universe and the collapse of the universe, there are 14, a succession of 14 Manus. And so the sun gave it to the first Manu and then it was passed on down. Uh, so uh, Vivaswan gave it to, to uh, uh, Manu and then Manu Rikshwakave Bravit. And then Manu gave it to his son uh, Ikshwaku. Ikshwaku uh, was the first king. So uh, one of the interesting things in the Upanishads and in the Gita is that this highest knowledge is often said to be the knowledge of the kings, the Rajarshis, the, the sages who were uh, 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 kings, who were Kshatriyas, who belonged to the Kshatriya community. It was not the knowledge of the Brahmins. The Brahmins were concerned with ritual and worship and uh, how to please the gods and all of that. Uh, but this knowledge of the Atman and knowledge of Brahman was discovered among the, uh, the kingly sages uh, passed, uh, passed down through them. You find this in the Upanishads, you find it here in the Gita. So to uh, uh, give the running translation of the verse, the Blessed Lord said, this eternal yoga I taught to Vivaswan. Vivaswan taught it to Manu and Manu taught it to Ikshvaku. Uh, so again, Vivaswan taught it to his son, Manu, who is the uh, establisher of human civilization. Uh, and Ikshvaku gave it, I mean, Manu gave it to his son, Ikshvaku, who was the first king. And from him started the dynasty of uh, kings coming down to our day. Uh, so uh, then we come to the second verse, which says, Evam parampara praptam imam rajarsha yo viduhu sakale ne hamahata yogo nashta parantapa. So that says, Evam parampara praptam iram, uh, imam rajarsha yo viduhu. So uh, this uh, yoga, which I'm teaching you, this yoga was handed down in parampara, that is, in a succession of teachers. Uh, uh, this, or rather, let me rephrase that according to the, the way it's stated here, that this uh, yoga, which was passed down uh, in a succession of teachers, uh, was known by the royal sages, by the kshatriyas, by the royal sages. Sakale ne hamahata yogo nashta parantapa. But by the, by the long passage of uh, time, Kalena uh, iha mahata, the great passage of time, long ages of time, yogo nashta parantapa, o parantapa, o Arjuna. Parantapa means uh, scorcher of your enemies because he was a kshatriya, a, a warrior. So, o, uh, o Arjuna, uh, this, uh, uh, by the great lapse of uh, time, this yoga was lost in this world. This yoga was lost in the world. That happens to everything. It happens to everything in the time. There is a birth in time, there is a growth and development, a sustenance, a period of stability, and then old age, uh, decrepitude, collapse, and death. That happens to everything, including planets, including galaxies, including stars. Everything is subject to that, including uh, this highest knowledge. And so that you find in all traditions, especially in the Eastern traditions where there was a, uh, the idea of vast amounts of time. Uh, in the Abrahamic traditions, the time was seen as a much shorter, a much shorter thing in, uh, from creation to uh, uh, human civilization and our present day. Uh, but in the, uh, the East, it was seen that there were billions of years in, of uh, creation. Uh, and so there was this idea of the cyclic movement of time, that things come into being, they grow, develop, uh, are sustained for some time, then they begin to collapse uh, and die. And then again, things are born, uh, etc. And you see that now with the, the uh, study of history, that you see that every civilization has come into being. It has its growth, development, uh, period of uh, uh, sustenance. Uh, and then it collapses uh, and dies. Uh, but no civiliza civilization dies completely. 
because the ideas of that civilization tend to be uh, passed on. The only partial exceptions are civilizations like in the Americas, when the uh, Europeans came to the Americas, certain civilizations were killed out completely, both by disease and by uh, actual intentional killing of uh, uh, people and enslaving and putting them through such labor that they died out. And so there were Native American civilizations which died, died out complete, uh, um, uh, completely, some of them. In fact, the great Mississippian uh, Native American culture, uh, which there's evidence of it still in the area around St. Louis on both sides of the Mississippi River in St. Louis. Uh, and that's why it's called the Mississippian culture. But it was a great civilization by the time the European explorers came to that part of North America, the civilization had vanished, not because of war, but because disease had preceded the conquerors. The diseases which were brought from Europe uh, swept over the continent and wiped out the whole Mississippian civilization. Uh, and so except in cases like that, you find that like ancient Greece, Greece had its great period of flowering it uh, grew, developed, and then it collapsed. And yet, in a sense, we are the inheritors of ancient Greece. We are continuing the civilization of ancient Greece in the Western civilization. Uh, the Egyptian civilization also, uh, it contributed to Greece. Greece contributed to Rome. Uh, in fact, uh, sometimes people have uh, said, rightly or wrongly, uh, it can be debated, of course, that America is really the inheritor of ancient Rome. Uh, the the, 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 uh, the uh, impulse that uh, Roman civilization brought into the world, first of all, it survived in the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church took over the organization of the Roman Empire. And then in modern times, uh, America took over that uh, organizational and engineering skill of the uh, ancient Romans. Modern organization was really uh, developed in ancient Rome. All civilizations had organization. That's what civilization is, is the organization of human society. But what we consider modern organization as sort of an impersonal system that's set up to uh, act on its own and to continue itself uh, through time, that uh, was really developed in ancient Rome. And so that continues also. But again, let me get back to the main idea. This is a long tangent. That is that everything comes into being, it grows, develops, and then it collapses on itself. And so you see the, uh, the, the, the uh, ancient Egypt, which for 3000 years it survived. Think of that. We can't imagine a civilization lasting 3000 years as a dynamic system, but it did. Uh, but finally it collapsed. And then Greece uh, flowered and it collapsed. Ancient Rome lasted for 700 years and collapsed as a vital civilization for 700 years. Uh, and then uh, the, the, the Spanish Empire, the Portuguese, the Spanish, uh, the British Empire, and then the American Empire. Uh, and that too will collapse sooner or later. Uh, uh, that too will collapse. So everything in time. And so religious traditions also, uh, they in time are forgotten. So you see in Buddhism, the idea that, that the Buddha himself taught that he was only the latest Buddha that there had been throughout uh, eternal time, because in the East, creation is considered eternal. Not that the earth is eternal, but the processes of creation. Galaxies themselves come into being and, are, uh, and collapse. Uh, the, the, uh, the universe as we know it uh, collapses in on itself, but the process goes on. The universe again will come out of the seed state into being, and so, uh, the uh, the uh, uh, religious traditions also. So the Buddha said that there had been many Buddhas before him in the ancient uh, th through eternal time, and he was only the latest Buddha. But the Buddhist tradition would disappear, and then another Buddha would come and revive it. So that was an idea which was already present in Hinduism at the time of the Buddha. Uh, the Buddha didn't come into a vacuum. He came. Uh, uh, out of uh, the Hindu tradition. And so those ideas were there. So that was a Hindu idea 
that uh, uh, even uh, religious traditions, they come into being, may last for thousands of years, but eventually people begin to forget them. And even within those thousands of years of the existence of a religion, you find, let me take a, an example outside of the, uh, our Vedanta tradition, the Christian tradition. You find with St. Francis of Assisi, uh, when he was a young man and was beginning his spiritual life, he had come back from his attempt to uh, go to the Middle East to fight in the, uh, uh, the Crusades. He came back to Assisi and there he was uh, bowing before the crucifix in the ruined church of St. Damien. And the crucifix spoke to him. Jesus from the crucifix spoke to him and said, St. Francis, uh, rebuild my church. And so he first thought at first that that meant the physical church because it was in a state of collapse. And so he began to uh, uh, fix it with uh, you know, masonry uh, to rebuild the actual physical church. Uh, but then he realized, no, Christ wanted him to rebuild the Christian church. Uh, and that was because the Christianity had uh, lapsed into a period of collapse. And that you see in Hinduism as well, periods where the tradition became uh, corrupted. When a person like Shankaracharya is born he, born, he was born at a time when there was terrible corruption in the Hindu world. And so he came to revive it. Sri Ramakrishna, we believe, came in modern times uh, to revive uh, not just Hinduism, but religion itself around the world. Uh, because religion itself and Hinduism and India had uh, fallen into a period of great weakness. And so to bring spiritually, spirituality back to the world. So this is important for this chapter because it, you know, you'll see in the next verses this idea uh, comes. So here again, the second verse says, uh, the running translation, this yoga thus traditionally handed down, the royal sages knew, that is they knew this yoga, through the great lapse of time, this yoga is lost in the world, O scorcher of foes, that is, O origin. Then he comes to verse uh, 3. Sa evayam maya tevya yoga prokta puratanaha bhaktosi me sakha cheti rahasyam yeta duttamam. So this says, Sa eva, uh, sa eva ayam maya te adya yoga prokta puratanaha. So this ancient, uh, uh, this eternal yoga, this Purata, this ancient Puratana, uh, this uh, ancient yoga uh, 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 has been taught by me to you today. Because again, the whole Gita is taking place on the battlefield in the course of one day. Uh, and the 18 chapters of the Gita is not a long text. Uh, so it, uh, if we, not that we should, assume that Krishna actually spoke on the battlefield in these verses of poetry uh, in this uh, polished meter but the uh, the idea is the story is that he gave the whole Gita on the battlefield which would have taken about an hour to uh, to relate uh, or an hour or a little more to uh, to relate and so this uh, ancient yoga Puratana yoga this ancient yoga has been taught by me to you today this which uh, uh, the son taught to Manu, and Manu, the progenitor of civilization itself, taught it to the first king, Ikshwaku, and handed down in succession for thousands and thousands of untold thousands of years uh, till the present. That I am t telling to you today, O uh, Arjuna. Bhaktosi uh, me sakacheti, you are uh, my devotee, you are devoted to me, and you are my friend. So you're not just a devotee, but you are my friend, O Arjuna. That is, uh, uh, the, uh, you are one who is loved by me. Uh, 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 so uh, this ancient, uh, this highest uh, ancient secret, Rasyam uh, uh, Oh, there's a, there's a mistake in the printing here. That's why it was uh, uh, confusing to me. That should be hieta da uttamam. So uh, 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 this supreme secret has been taught uh, to you by me today. So giving the running translation, because there's often in Sanskrit verses, because Sanskrit is held together by internal glue. English and even more so Chinese 
word order is extremely important because if I say uh, the ball hit the bat, that's very different from the bat, uh, the b- bat hit the ball. Uh, so just the word order makes a completely different meaning. But in Sanskrit, there's internal glue in each word which shows how it relates to other words in the sentence. And so you can put words in any kind of order that you want. Uh, so in, uh, in Sanskrit, it's often difficult to translate on the fly because suddenly you realize, well, something at the bottom actually went with uh, what was up at the top. <laughs> so, so the uh, running translation is, that very ancient yoga has been taught by me to you this day since you are my devotee and friend, for this is a supreme secret. Uh, uh, so, uh, so he put it to the, the, the translator here, put it together so it goes in the order of the verse. Uh, but actually, that very ancient yoga, which is a supreme secret, has been taught to me, uh, taught by me to you this day, since you are my devotee and friend. So uh, uh, that. I saw a beautiful example of what the intention of this, uh, these verses are, these first three verses are, uh, when I w- was uh, uh, at a conference in a retreat, Ratna Ling, a Tibetan Buddhist retreat uh, near the coast of Northern California. A very beautiful retreat, a huge retreat property. And uh, uh, there, there were a number of of us from different uh, traditions uh, uh, meeting to talk about, we were representatives of the different dharma traditions. Just as you have the Abrahamic traditions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. So uh, now there's the, among those, the followers of the dharmic traditions, there's an awakening awareness that we should uh, come together as people from the same religious family, not in exclusion of others, but in recognition that we traditions that came out of India, we have uh, many things in common that we should uh, begin to emphasize, recognize and emphasize, uh, just as the Abrahamic traditions have come together. Uh, uh, at least many of them have come together on all three traditions and try to find their common roots uh, and to emphasize their common roots. So. Uh, uh, Hinduism, uh, Buddhism, Jainism, Sikhism, uh, those are the uh, major Dharma traditions. So we had gathered in uh, Ratna Ling and uh, uh, one day several of us were walking around the grounds just to see the grounds, extensive grounds, and we came to a big warehouse on the grounds where a forklift was bringing out a huge uh, pallet bundle uh, for shipping, uh, shipping by truck. Uh, of the sacred texts, because in the one in this uh, retreat, one of the things they do besides holding retreats is publish the sacred scriptures of Tibet. And so I was uh, I was struck when I saw there was a young, uh, about nineteen or twenty year old Lama. His father is uh, a Lama, and his mother is an American uh, follower of Tibetan Buddhism. Uh, and so he himself has been brought up as a Lama. Lama doesn't mean monk. Lama means guru. Lama means teacher. And so in Tibetan Buddhism, they have married lamas just as we have married gurus. So um, when he saw the pallet of the scriptures being uh, driven on the forklift out of the warehouse, he stopped and closed his uh, eyes and held his hands and stayed there for a long time uh, in an act of reverence, seeing the scriptures. And I was struck with the wonder at the great devotion that he was showing because having studied Tibetan history and Buddhist history and philosophy and with concentration on Tibetan and Chinese uh, things, uh, I knew that uh, the Tibetans have great regard for their scriptures and for the lineage of their teachers because they knew with what tremendous sacrifice that was handed down to them. That uh, at a time when the uh, the invasions from the Middle East, the uh, Islamic invasions were coming into India and sweeping across North India, destroying everything in their path. They swept through, uh, destroyed Nalanda, Varanasi, and many uh, uh, holy places across North India. Nalanda was razed to the ground. This ancient great university, the library was burned. It was as bad uh, at least or worse than the uh, burning of the uh, library in ancient Alexandria. 
because La, La, Nalanda was a huge university with all branches of ancient uh, Eastern wisdom and not just from India, but from other countries as well. And so the whole thing was destroyed. So their stories are uh, recorded in the Tibetan tradition of uh, people coming down from the highlands in Tibet, off the high Tibetan pa uh, plateau, coming down into the scorching plains of India where they weren't used to the diseases, not used to the heat and the humidity, terrible suffering. Uh, and they would uh, gather in the rubble of Nalanda, uh, under, uh, 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 caves made under the uh, rubble of the bricks, and there by torchlight at night. They wouldn't do it in the day because if someone saw them, they might be killed also for being uh, uh, idol worshippers. And so they would go in, uh, sneak in at night with just a candle flame, and there the scriptures would be uh, written down by the Tibetans who had come to uh, get this wisdom from the uh, from their Indian Buddhist teachers and then carry it back into the highlands of Tibet. This was a time when there were no roads. There were no roads into Tibet. You had to walk through jungle. You had to cross into the mountains. There were brigands. There were uh, highway robbers all along the way. Even in the 20th century, that was true with the, the highway robbers when the uh, early parts of the 20th century when people would go to Mount Kailas on pilgrimage. I know a Swami who went in the 1920s and was attacked by highway robbers on, along the way. And so with great difficulty they came. Many of them died from disease and from the unaccustomed heat in the plains, but they brought the scriptures back to Tibet uh, and preserved them. And then with the Chinese invasion of Tibet in the uh, 1950s, uh, again, 6,000 monasteries were raised to the ground huge libraries with texts that were only found in Tibet. Texts not just from the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, because Tibetan Buddhism is really Indian Buddhism that was transferred to Tibet with the Tibetan cultural flavor added to it. But uh, Indian Buddhism was taken wholesale to Tibet. So all of these Indian Buddhist texts, Tibetan Buddhist texts, Hindu, Buddha, uh, Hindu texts, Jaina texts, medical texts, astronomy, uh, the sciences, uh, 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 grammatical texts, which existed nowhere but in Tibet, uh, were destroyed. Massive libraries were burned uh, 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 to the ground. And so uh, the Tibetans who fled from Tibet in the 1950s and 60s, as well as later, uh, many of them carried as many manuscripts as they could salvage uh, uh, into India so that they could be saved. And so places like this monastery in uh, uh, California, or this retreat in uh, California, uh, they are printing those texts in order to save them. And so seeing the devotion of this uh, young monk, uh, and it was not a show, he wasn't doing it for me, there, there were just three or four of us with him. Uh, it was a spontaneous act of devotion for these scriptures. So that is what Sri Krishna is telling to Arjuna, that this is a sacred knowledge which has been passed down for so long and it's been forgotten by people. And now I'm giving it to you, O Arjuna, this sacred knowledge, life-giving knowledge, which has uh, been forgotten, I'm giving to you because you are my devotee and you are my friend. So then uh, this causes a doubt in Arjuna, Arjuna's mind. So then he asks Arjuna vacha aparam bhavato janma param janma vivasvataha kathametad bijani yam tvamado proktavaniti. So Arjuna vacha. Arjuna said, aparam bhavato janma. Uh, uh, respected sir, your birth was later. Uh, param janma vivasvataha. The birth of Vyaswan was earlier. How am I supposed to understand this? That you told this in ancient times to be Vaswan. So sir, your, your birth was uh, 35 uh, years ago, 30, 35 years ago, you were, uh, you were born. Vivaswan was born a million, uh, in, the, in the tradition millions of years ago. Uh, Vivaswan was born millions of years ago. And of course, if you take Vivaswan as actually the sun, uh, then uh, it, it was uh, <laughs> billions of years ago. Uh, so uh, you were born uh, just the other day. Vivaswan was born in the extraordinarily ancient times. How am I un to understand that you gave this knowledge to Vivaswan in ancient times? I'm confused. And so then uh, we'll come to Sri Krishna's answer. 
Shri uh, verse 5, Shri Bhagavan Uvacha, Bahuni me vyati tani janmani tava charjuna tanyaham veda sarvani natvam vetta parantapa. So Bahuni me vyati tani janmani tava charjuna. Uh, uh, I have had uh, many, many Bahuni, many uh, past births. Tava uh, charjuna, and you also have had many births, O Arjuna. I have had many past births. You also have had many past births, O Arjuna. Tani aham veda sarvani. I know all of them. I know all of them. Natvam betta parantapa. But, O parantapa, but, O Arjuna, you don't know them. So I have had many uh, past births, and so have you. But I know all of my past births, but you don't know yours. And, of course, uh, Sri Krishna, being... Uh, God himself, he knew the past lives of Arjuna as well. Uh, 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 so uh, when he says, Tanyaham veda sarvani natvam vetta parantama, I know all of them, but you don't know them. I know all of them means I know all of mine as well as yours, as well as those of others. I know all of my past births. So this is one of the early men mentions of the full doctrine of reincarnation. In the Vedas, there are passages where, uh, especially in the Upanishads, where this idea uh, comes up. And so the idea probably did not, uh, or probably began in the Vedic age, but it wasn't uh, discussed. Uh, and so the origin of the idea of rebirth, we don't know uh, where that came. But as you know, there are two main views uh, about uh, human life. Uh, and within those two main categories of views, there are many differences of opinion on each side, uh, each category. But the two main views are that we have had many lives in the past. And uh, that's one view, uh, that which is shared by all of the Dharma traditions, Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, uh, Sikhism. Uh, and then the other view that we have only one birth and one death. And that is, uh, of course, the modern scientific view. Uh, and it's the view in Christianity and Islam. Judaism, however, uh, though many Jews may not believe in reincarnation, it's quite possible to believe in reincarnation in Judaism. It's not forbidden in Judaism, and many mystical Jews believe in reincarnation. Uh, and so it's quite accepted and acceptable in Judaism, uh, even if it, it's not something that everyone has to believe, but it's there as a belief uh, of many. Uh, and so in the, uh, in the Indic traditions or the Dharma traditions, uh, that's just a part of life. Everyone uh, accepts the idea of reincarnation as part of what you grow up with. Only, of course, in modern times, there are uh, people in India who uh, uh, and belonging to these Dharma, or who grew up in these Dharmic traditions, who no longer accept it because of modern scientific education. But uh, otherwise, people grow up with the, 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 uh, the belief that it's just as, uh, as uh, natural as uh, we take anything. And so the idea of rebirth is that uh, this life is not our only life. How do you explain the differences among human beings? Now, the modern scientific ex explanation is that it's a, a combination of genetics uh, and uh, uh, upbringing, including prenatal influences and then postnatal uh, uh, nurture uh, uh, and socializing. These are what explain the differences among people. The, uh, the uh, idea in Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, Sikhism uh, is that no, that doesn't explain everything. They don't deny now that they have modern scientific uh, knowledge, they don't deny the modern scientific aspect. They don't deny the uh, genetic factor. Uh, but they do deny that uh, the tendencies, uh, that all the mental tendencies uh, that are seen in a person, that they come through genetics. Uh, the idea of reincarnation, and let me, and this goes for, uh, for all of these uh, dharmic traditions, is that you are reborn uh, to, to parents which will give you the material that's appropriate to your next birth, that will give you the, the physical material uh, that is appropriate to what you need to manifest and experience in your next birth. Uh, and so uh, understanding that in modern times, 
there's a uh, connection between your past tendencies from a past life and the uh, genetic material that you inherit in this life. That you're born in a particular place, in a particular family, in particular circumstances with particular genetic configuration, uh, which will allow you to continue your spiritual evolution. Um, and so again, the basic idea is that when we die, we uh, pass some time in an uh, uh, interim before we're reborn in human form. It may be very quickly we're reborn in human uh, in a human life, or it may be after a long uh, interregnum uh, where uh, before we're reborn in a human uh, a human form. Uh, and so before this life itself, uh, we had a previous birth. And before that uh, birth, there was a uh, birth before that, going back endlessly in time. It said in the uh, Vedanta tradition that there are six, and off, offhand, I don't remember all of the six, but there's six things which are unknowable. Not unknowable because we don't know enough or we haven't had uh, enough scientific ex, uh, examination or so forth, but things that are unknowable in the nature of them. And one of them is, uh, when was my first incarnation? Why is that unknowable? Because it's asking, when was I, who am eternal being itself? When, at what time did I enter into time? Well, that makes no sense because I am timeless. Uh, I like to think of it like a house of mirrors. Uh, and uh, I can't explain this adequately because it would take too long. But when you enter into a house of mirrors, and you, there's always in a house of mirrors, uh, like in a fairground or something, there's a place where there are mirrors which are opposing each other. So you look into one mirror and you see an infinite regress of uh, reflections. And so as a kid, I would love to go into the mirrors. Some of them, of course, show them uh, you, you hugely fat and some show you extremely skin, uh, skinny because of the curvature of the mirrors. But then I always loved this also trying, to, and I would do it at home, setting up mirrors too trying to see the last reflection, <laughs> but you can't. It just gets infinitely small. Uh, you can't find the last reflection. So when we find our, when we are in, ti in time, because of ignorance, there's an infinite uh, uh, succession of uh, reflections. And so you can't find your first birth, uh, that when you are in time, the succession goes on forever backwards, that that is what time does to us. Reality is outside of time. Time takes reality and stretches it into uh, the experience of time. Just as reality is outside of space, it's not spatial at all. Uh, but space extends things uh, out in space and time extends things out in time. So once we find ourselves through ignorance, how, there's no how answer to how either, because that's asking what caused that which is outside of causation, what caused it to enter into time, space, and causation. You can, the question itself is illogical. That's the nature of ignorance. Ignorance means, uh, uh, ignorance in the Vedantic understanding, cosmic ignorance, is it can't be understood by its very nature. If it could be understood, it wouldn't be ignorance. It would be science. The fact that it's uh, uh, inexplicable, uh, the fact that it's ignorance means it's inexplicable. Uh, and so, um, uh, again, trying to find the, when I was first, when was my first birth? How many times have I been reborn? And why did I enter into uh, ignorance in the first place? That's all asking questions which can't be asked. It's like the, uh, the uh, metamorphosis uh, of Kafka, when the person uh, in, the, uh, in the story of Kafka, uh, wakes up and finds that he's an insect. Uh, so imagine that you wake up one morning from a dream and uh, you're suffering from some uh, mental infirmity and you think that you're an insect. And you go to the doctor and, and ask him to explain that, uh, why you've become an insect. And you know, the doctor says, well, you're not an insect. Uh, and you think the doctor is crazy. I'm an insect, it's obvious. The doctor is crazy, I have to go find another doctor. So then you go to uh, a doctor who has some psychological subtlety and the doctor realizes what has happened, that you're suffering from a delusion. 
and the doctor realizes that you're not going to, if you're just saying you're not an insect, that's not going to work. And so the doctor works with your condition uh, and tells, well, yes, I can help you get back to your normal shape. Uh, uh, get rid of this insect form and begins to work with the person, assuming the delusion of the patient. And so that's what the scriptures do. They assume our uh, present uh, ignorance and then explain how we come out of that ignorance. But the experience of countless sages recorded through history is that once we awaken from our uh, mistaken identity. The experience is, oh my God, this is what I always was. And somehow in the back of my understanding, I never forgot it. This is the most obvious thing. And I always knew this somehow, but I didn't, I, I forgot that I knew it or I overlooked the fact that I knew it. So the experience of enlightenment is an experience of recognition. Pratnyabhignya recognition, an experience that, oh my God, this was always the truth, the most obvious truth. How did I overlook it? It was right there. It was there all of the time, but somehow I didn't see it. So it's an experience of astonishment, but part of that astonishment is the fact that this was always true, even when I was dreaming something else, when I thought that I was weak and subject to birth and death and all of that, uh, it was true even then. So uh, anyway, I've gone way off uh, topic. Uh, it's related to the topic, but uh, it's going pretty far from the uh, topic. And so again, Arjuna uh, asks about uh, how am I to understand this? And Sri Krishna says that I have known uh, many, pa uh, I have had uh, many lives and so have you. I know all, remember all of them, uh, you don't know Arjuna. And so I'll take one more uh, verse. And then the next time we'll start with verse seven, which continues the idea, but brings in, uh, of course, actually this next verse six brings in the idea of the incarnation. And then from verse seven forward, he explains the idea of incarnation. And then eventually in this chapter comes back to the science of work. And so, uh, well, let me say another word before I get to verse six about reincarnation. And so he says, I know all of them, uh, you don't, O oh Arjuna. And so one of the arguments against reincarnation is that we don't remember our past lives. And nobody remembers them. And so they, uh, why should we assume something that we have no experience of? That's a faulty scientific assumption. If there's, uh, we could make up all kinds of things to explain the universe, but if it's not testable, if it's not uh, uh, subject to analysis and testing, what's the use of imagining things that can't be uh, imagined? We should take account for what is, what can be tested, what can be experienced. That's all that we know. Other things are just uh, useless imagination. And so why assume reincarnation? Uh, the answer to that is, first of all, if you don't want to believe in reincarnation, that's fine. We even had one of our great Swamis, Swami Ishwarananda in Kerala, in Trichur. He wrote a book against reincarnation. He didn't accept reincarnation. So another one of our Swamis, Swami Satprakashananda, who founded the center in St. Louis, a great Swami from what is now Bangladesh, from Dhaka. He wrote a book, How a Man is Reborn, in order to refute Swami Ishwarananda's book against reincarnation. <laughs> So, so uh, the, uh, most Hindus and certainly most uh, people in our order, uh, in fact, everybody that I know uh, believes in reincarnation. It's not a dogma that you have to believe. So if it doesn't make sense to you, don't believe. Don't believe anything that doesn't make sense to you, that, doesn't, uh, that you don't see some use to. So it's not a dogma. But why would someone uh, uh, believe in reincarnation other than just, you know, my parents uh, believed in it, uh, their parents believed it in it, society believes in it, so I believe in it. Well, that's not a good enough reason. Uh, so why should one believe, would one believe in it? Uh, one reason is that there are at all times, and I know of two cases, and I've uh, seen evidence of hundreds of cases, literally, literally hundreds of cases, of people who do remember their past lives, usually small children. Uh, I know of two cases where children remembered their past. One was an American and a Christian family that the family had no idea of reincarnation. 
but they all came to believe it because their uh, little boy, from the time he was four and five, for about nine months, he began to tell about his life, uh, his previous life. Uh, and at first they said, you didn't have a previous life, you were born here. And then he would talk about his life in Mexico, mentioning places and names of people. He had no exposure to Mexico. He didn't know anything about Mexican uh, uh, geography and cities and so forth. But uh, over a course of months, he gave elaborate descriptions of his life and how at a certain age, he, uh, his family brought him over into Texas and uh, then they would go back and forth from Texas to Mexico and all of these things, things that he couldn't possibly have known. Um, and uh, so the whole family, it, a time came when the boy stopped talking about it and then later he didn't remember anything about it. And another case I knew of in India, in one of our schools, a girl who kept telling her parents who were teachers at one of our Ramakrishna mission schools in Narendrapur, kept telling her parents, I want to go back to my other home. And so she finally became insistent. They kept telling her, well, this is your home. And she said, no, I want to go to my other home. And so she gave them a dress and told them about her previous life. And so finally, in order to uh, uh, convince the girl that, you know, the, where, that this was just imagination, they took her to this, they found the address and took her there. And they got to the house and the girl uh, uh, got out of the rickshaw and went running into the house uh, before the parents could catch her. And so people from inside the house came out to see what the commotion was. Uh, was. And so the parents told her what had happened, why they had brought their girl. And they said, oh, about uh, six or seven years, the girl was about five years old. And said, about six years ago, uh, we had a daughter who when she was six years old, she was hit by a bus and was killed. And, uh, uh, and then they took, uh, the, 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 took the parents into the house and found the girl. She was in the room where the little girl used to stay. And it opened up a chest which had uh, stored the little girl's toys. And she was saying, look, my toys are still here. And she knew the house, knew where everything was. And uh, so again, that, uh, there have been American scientific researchers who have looked into this and written books on uh, case studies of children who remember past lives. And many of them are like this, where the, the child knew things that they could not possibly have known from the, the experiences of this, uh, their present life. So that's one reason. Another reason is that uh, we sometimes a person has a sudden memory of a past life which comes as a memory. It actually comes as a memory. Now, many people uh, in America and Europe, uh, Westerners, uh, you'll find many people who claim memories of past lives who are just being romantic. you find that most of them who remember a past life, uh, they were Cleopatra or uh, uh, some great heroic uh, figure or something. And <laughs> they never say, oh, in my past life, I was a garbage collector or something like that. And uh, so it's a, just a way of romanticizing one's past. But there are people in the West as well as in the East who do remember suddenly something from their past life. General George Patton, the great uh, American World War II general, he claimed that he remembered past lives and that he had been a warrior various times in various past lives. And that's why in this life he was born to fight. He was born for World War II, he felt that. And he was convinced he didn't grow up in a Hindu family or a family with any Eastern influence, but he was convinced that he had been uh, uh, reborn a number of times and a succession of times as a warrior. And uh, so sometimes people do have suddenly, something will suddenly trigger a memory. Uh, uh, like I have a friend who once was uh, trimming up, uh, cl climbed up in a tree and was trimming a tree when I forget what it, what it was, but some uh, a saw or something that he was using suddenly fell, or maybe it was the loppers, fell and cut his leg. And suddenly he had a memory when he cut his leg with an instrument like that. And he had the memory, war is terrible. And he remembered having fought in a, uh, uh, in a war long, long ago and being injured uh, right where this instrument uh, fell on him. So something that suddenly triggers a memory. So that's another reason. A third reason is that many people just find it logical. I've come to the end of time. Uh, so let me just finish this. And then I'll mention the previous next verse because I said I would go over it and then we'll close. 
So um, uh, the, uh, uh, gosh, now I forgot uh, the, the, the other incident I was going to, going to tell. So let me come to verse six. We'll go over it next time, but I will read it, translate it, and then we'll go over it next time. But since I said we'll go over it, it says, Ajo pisan yavya yatma bhuta namishwaro pisan prakritim swamarishthaya sambhavam yatma mayaya. So here he begins the doctrine of the incarnation. Though I am birthless, Ajo pisan, though I am birthless, Avyayatma Bhutana Mishwaropi, so though I am Avyaya, uh, immutable, and the Lord of creatures, Bhutana Mishwaropi, son, yet resorting to my Prakriti, Prakritim Swamadhishthaya, I come into being through my own inscrutable paya, power, my Maya, Sambhavami, uh, Sambhavam Yatma Mayaya. So though I am birthless, immutable, and the Lord of creatures, I being God, Yet resorting to my prakriti, my nature, my uh, creative power, uh, I come into being through my own inscrutable maya, my own inscrutable creative power. So this is the idea, the beginning of the idea of the incarnation. So the first place where this idea is uh, fully developed is in the Bhagavad Gita. In the Vedas, you don't find the idea of the incarnation of God. Uh, you find it in the Puranas, you find it in the Mahabharata and the Ramayana. Uh, well, this is the Mahabharata, of course, part of the Mahabharata. So here you find it as well as in the Ramayana. But this is where you find the first full exposition of the idea and why it happens. So uh, that we will start with uh, 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 next time. So, uh, oh, I know the story I was going to tell. So let me tell that so that I feel that I finished what I was going to say today. And that is once many years ago, and I might have told this before in this class, I don't remember. Uh, I was in Berkeley uh, visiting and the Swami who was in charge of Berkeley told me that uh, this morning, a student from the uh, theological seminary is coming uh, as part of his coursework. He has to visit a religion that's not Christian, a uh, place of worship. And so he wants to come and can you show him around and talk to him? So I did, I showed him around, talked to him. And then uh, he asked me, do you believe in reincarnation? And so I thought, because he was from a conservative uh, Christian uh, denomination, uh, I said, do you believe in reincarnation? So I thought, uh, I'll, I'll answer him, but the idea flashed that uh, now we're going to get into an argument and uh, there's no use to that, but I'll tell him anyway. So I said, yes, I do. I said, uh, it's not a dogma that you have to believe, but most of our people believe it and I do believe it. And so then he surprised me and said, I also believe it. Uh, because to me, it's the only explanation for uh, uh, the only uh, explanation which is appealing for the diverse circumstances of people in life. And then I had one other experience like that around the same time. It was I had been a, a, a monk by that time about 15 years, uh, and I happened to uh, run into an old school uh, friend whom I hadn't seen since I left high school. Uh, and he would, it turned out that I'd gone into a hardware store to buy something and he was running the hardware store. So he recognized me and I recognized him. Uh, and so he asked me what I was doing. And so I told him, you know, I'm a Hindu monk. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> and uh, so he took interest instead of uh, many people, when you say that, then they say, oh, and they tell, How do you, what do you think about the weather today? Or to change the topic to something else. But uh, he took an interest in it and asked me about it. And then he asked, do you believe in reincarnation? And I said, yes. He said, well, so do I. Uh, and so in my, in my own family, my aunt, who had no connection to India or anything Eastern, she always believed in reincarnation just because it made sense to her. So those are the reasons for believing in it. So the final chant, as usual, Om Yam Ram Ha Varunendra Rudra Marutas Tun Bandi Devyai Stavai Vedai Sangha Padakravo Panishadai Rgayanti Yam Samaga Vyana Vastita Tadgatena Manasa Pashyanti Yam Yogino Yasyandam Navidu Sura Sura Gana Devaya Tasmai Namaha that says, we bow to that supreme being whom Brahma and other gods praise with divine hymns. 
whose glory is the singers of the Sama hymns sing through the Vedas and Upanishads, whom the yogis see with their minds absorbed in that through meditation, and whose end and beginning neither the gods nor the asuras know. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Om Peace, Peace, Peace be unto us all.